Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... Uh, Chris O'Neill from Ninth Level Games. I am the co-founder and uh, creative chief creative at Ninth Level. I have to say that I enjoy Ninth Level Games. I There's a Cobalt uh, ate, ate My Baby. It's, uh, it's, our original, it's our original title. Yes, uh, next, yes. year, next year is uh, twenty the twenty fifth anniversary. Wow, that's yeah. it's been it's been I didn't realize it was that long. Um, <laughs> it was it was my first introduction into ninth level games, um, and it's been one of my my favorite games to play whenever us uh, old old schoolers get together and and want to play something pretty fast. It's like it's a great game. Most well, recently, the newest oh, version, uh, the newest version that will be coming out. Um, the end of this year, the beginning of next year, is super fast. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay, perhaps we can do an interview about that sometime in the future, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I would love yeah. to, especially <laughs> if you're an old school fan. Uh, and, for people that know the system, it's um, uh, just everything has just gotten... Uh, the introduction, the moving of Cobalt Did My Baby from its beer engine to the uh, polymorph to make it compatible with everything else that we do has just made it um, super straightforward, super fast. Uh, it allows us to really just focus on what the core jokes are, like of the system, like what really makes what really makes everything tick, you know. Which uh, turns out it's not um, doing math. <laughs> <laughs> so mazes, um, yes, I mean, yes. Be role playing. Yeah. This so my, I. This is my hard place. This is my. Is my baby. Oh, well, if I may ask, why why do you why do you say that? Because you've made this, um, ninth level games have put out a bunch of great, well, different role playing games. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to make a fantasy role playing game. I wanted to make my Dungeons and Dragons, if you would, and um, that's just basically always been a bad idea. Um, it's almost never there's almost never been a time when it was the right thing to be doing uh and yet people did have done it over and over again and uh it wasn't until we came up with a system that was unique enough to warrant uh going down to the dungeon right like i mean um the 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 history of the way role playing you know tends to work is it's very cyclical. Like there'll be, oh well, we've made all these changes and these updates, and we have this new technology, uh, and then there'll be a rash of games that all come out um, that are using those mechanics, using those activities, and then there'll be another piece, and we'll do that again and again. And um, uh, usually, those innovations don't come in the form of a fantasy game uh, because the fantasy game is pretty much blocked. Uh, with Dungeons and Dragons, you know, except for the one time they dropped the ball and Pathfinder picked it up. Now, you know, so getting an opportunity to actually make a real fantasy role playing game for me uh, was the most exciting. Uh, was the most exciting thing. Even though I love all the other games that we've made, and um, um, these days we're really actively trying to get other writers to design games using our polymorph system um which is also really exciting especially because it's allowing us to kind of you know push out and look for unique and individual voices for people that want to make games about things that no one's made games about before hmm. so first thing i want to ask uh, this has its own rule system it's not a, a module for um a previous edition of a D and D, uh, this is his own own game. What if I may ask? What made you decide uh, to go that route? Uh, you could have easily just made modules upon modules. Yeah, um, it probably honestly, we'd probably make more money if we did that. Um, uh, but uh, that's not what fuels ninth level. Um, the uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I like uh, I like making content, but. Um, for me, it's all. I'm, I've always been a, a systems guy, um, uh, and we had started many years ago working on a system to play a game that no one had ever made before, and that game was a, a squad-based science fiction game um, that involved multiple characters and a lot of activities, and 
Um, at the same time I was making that game, I was also working on a fantasy board game um, that was kind of a uh, hex hex and dungeon crawl, like a point crawl kind of uh, stripped down fantasy board game. Uh, and elements started to like kind of all roll into each other. And um, at knife level, our design philosophy is, is uh, uh, whenever you have an idea, you run with the idea until it's not interesting anymore and then put it on the shelf. Um, and then maybe you get it down later. Uh, and uh, I found myself going back to a bunch of other cool ideas that we had had and bringing them all together. And um, what was left on the table was the game that would become Polymorph, which is what the under, what we call the underlying system. Um, and the underlying system was interesting enough that when we started to apply it to different game ideas, um, it was very exciting. Uh, and it wasn't just exciting because those game ideas were good, because people were really excited by the underlying rule system. Mm. Uh, one of the big uh, experiences is that we get is, is that someone will play one of our games, like you held up Rebel Scum earlier. People play Rebel Scum and they'll go, "Oh, I know, you know, I could use this to make this horror game, or oh, I could do this and I could make a game about teenage mutant ninja reptiles," you know, and uh, you know, all of a sudden it starts to spin off, and that's uh, that's for 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 my buck. That's the uh, a sign that uh, that we made a good system. Mm. So Mazes, it's, it's just one book, and uh, half of it is character creation, and the other half is the the the, the, the adventure itself. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say a third a third of the book is how to how to play a fantasy role playing game. A mm. third is how to make characters and then the other third is is how to make adventures right hmm. um, uh, especially how to make adventures specifically in this very specific subgenre which is not just fantasy but it is it is we're going down into the dungeon to kick a monster's butt uh, <laughs> and, uh, take all stuff right? like hmm. so the dungeon crawl subgenre uh, one of our goals is is that even though this is a to uh, 230, the 236 page book. Um, uh, besides like quickly looking at it during character creation, um, or looking at it and using it as a resource during uh, adventure creation, um, you don't really need to look at it um, during play because everything that you need should be on your character sheet, which is again one of the design philosophies in Mesa's hmm. and in all the polymorph games, to be honest. Oh, okay, so. Uh Talking a little bit about character creation here. So it seems like in, in the community, RPG community, this is considered an OSR book. Although the the, the classes here are really because it's you have sword classes, shadow classes, sorcery classes. But even under that, it's almost like like these subclasses. So it's like a, a very interesting new perspective uh, to the OSR. Uh, would, would, am I correct in describing that? I, I, yeah, I think it's an interesting way of looking at it. I, I um, only recently have I started to think about it from an OSR perspective. It, that there's really three classes. Um, if you really want to think about it, it's there are there uh, the way that we set everything up in the game is that there are four roles: R O L E, uh, four roles that you're playing in the game, and those roles are either the paragon, which is the expert, the person that's going out to do. Um, they're very good at what they do. Um, the vanguard, uh, who is the person who wants to move around and do things. The fighter, who wants to hit things with their weapons. And the sentinel, the person who wants to survive. So if you look at those four roles, each of those roles in a polymorph game is defined by a single die. A d4, a d6, a d8, or d10. You only ever roll that die. Um, uh, and if you intersect those roles with aspects, and aspects are kind of like What's uh, the, the aspect is if a role is what do I do in the game? An aspect is how do I do it? Am I a sword? And, you know, do I do it with martial abilities? Am I a sorcerer? Do I do it with magic? Um, or am I shadow? Do I do it with skill and subterfuge? Um, and it's interesting because kind of an OSR perspective, we line up more about how you do it than what you're doing. Um, uh, because it is kind of the fighter, the thief, and the and the wizard, right? 
Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things I try to get to people when they're looking at me is, is, especially if they have an OSR background, is to not think about it that way. Is to first ask the question, what do you want to do in the game? Um, And then say, how do you want to do it? And then when you bring those two together, it's going to tell you uh, a bunch of classes that are good for it. In fact, in our game, Return to Dark Tower, which is the next game that comes out that's 100% mazes compatible, that is literally how you make a character. The Each of the characters is a... There's one each for each aspect in each uh, role. Hmm. So if you want to be the martial... If you want to be the sword fighter, you're the brutal warlord. Right? So... Because it's those two things together. Oh, okay. Now, for the adventure itself, how would you say... Uh, anyone that's heard, hearing about this for the first time, how would you say your adventures differ from uh, different modules that are out there? Well, one of the nice things is we actually do have a bunch of modules that are for sale um, on Drive Through RPG, and we just started to print them uh, in paper uh, for people uh, off of our website. Um, but our modules are designed around the idea of saying each adventure is kind of a standalone that's supposed to exist for two to three hours. Um, so instead of each module being a large scale adventure where there's lots of different pieces, it's just one little piece. Um, in fact, we, uh, we have some information about this in the mazes book itself. Um, but our in-house design philosophy is this idea that says, uh, every kind of thing is like five rooms. Like, so we're going to have five points that we're going to try to define. Uh, so we want some kind of, uh, uh, an opening scene. Uh, we want uh, we want some choices um, that make uh, that, that have an impact on the story. Uh, we're going to have a limited environment in which to uh, explore. Uh, we're going to have you know different ways to um, to come to the story. One of the big rules in mazes is called the door to adventure. So there's no there's no equipment, there's no quest gathering, there's no background information. When you uh, when you are playing mazes, you start the game at the door to adventure. Um, so you are literally always just right in the middle uh, of, of the beginning of this whatever it is that you're doing. And what we do is we ask a series of questions. Um, so that the players have an opportunity to get you buy-in to the adventure, but also so that um, you know they they get to bring what it is that they're doing. So we can have an adventure called the Tomb of the Ledge, um, but the first question that we're going to ask is like, why have you come here? Have you come here to destroy the evil lich, or have you come here to raid this tomb for treasure? And depending on that, is going to totally change the way that the party and the maze controller interact with that adventure. Um, I've run a bunch of Raid the Lich Tomb kind of adventures where the players have started off and said, we're here to destroy the evil Lich. And those games go a very specific kind of way. Whereas if they're like, we're here for power and glory, invariably, if they get an opportunity to bend the knee to the Lich, they always take it because that's really what those players wanted to do in the beginning. The moment I said, oh, you have an opportunity to be on the Lich's side, they're like, yeah, I want to be on the Lich's side. Uh, it's uh, 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 it's just really kind of fun. So now, one of the things that's cool is in our mazes book, we actually give you some rules to take OSR material. So either old TSR modules or even modern DCC uh, swords and wizardry. My personal favorite, um, old school essentials. I love old school essentials. Um, any any material is made for any of those games. You can run mazes in. Um, with a very simple set of rules to convert the stat blocks. Um, because those adventures um, will work fine. Um, they don't... You can run You can run old school adventures with the mindset and the rules of mazes. Um, or you can run mazes with those old school essentials, if that makes sense. Because there's a very kind of different play to that. Because mazes has some different rules and conditions where some of that other stuff doesn't matter. Hmm. So, um, what what do you have exactly? So this is its own game system in a way. Uh, what do you do for like the monster, the bestiary? Do you? Uh, um... uh, uh, there is a bestiary in the back of of uh, of mazes, um, and there's rules for how to create them. Hmm. Uh, uh, they're they're pretty straightforward. 
Um, every monster has got a name. You have uh, some tags, which we call edges. And then you have a danger and hearts. And, and danger and hearts are basically like level and hit, hit, hit points. Um, uh, but they're very narrative in, in scope and in control. Uh, and there's rules for how to take and use any OSR information that you have uh, and convert it um, to use them in basis. Hmm. Uh, going back to... Uh, of, of oh, monsters. sorry. Oh, sorry. Say that again? I'm sorry. I was saying it's just an endless world of monsters. And in fact, we, we very specifically focus on the idea of, um, well, you know, keep it weird. <laughs> uh, so it's like you, you should never encounter a bear in mazes, right? It's a, oh, it's a fire bear or it's a, it's a, uh, an icker pit bear or, you know, like make it weird for some reason uh, because um, it's, we're emulating a certain type of fantasy fiction. So. Mm. Uh, talking a little bit, going back about uh, character classes a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. If I may ask, uh, what are some of your favorites? Uh, what what is what's so, what you, what, you, what what reactions have you had from people playing uh, certain characters? Well, it's funny. Um, we you know uh, uh, us we have more character classes coming all the time. I just put one out, uh, the Brave Torchbearer, which might be my new favorite character class um, uh, because they're very easy to create. Um, Another one that I really love is the Last Elf, which is like you're effectively, you know, Elric of, of Mel Nibine, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but it's very, it's always interesting. There's there's a couple character classes that people always jump at when we're doing um, like convention demos. Uh, the Outcast Bugbear is very very popular. Uh, the Mad Alchemist is very very popular. Uh, the Haunted Librarian is very very popular. Um, people like being haunted for some reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, people like being haunted. Um, uh, one of my favorites, one of my favorites is the Dangerous Bravo, which is just like, you know, I'm a cool guy with a sword. Like, there isn't a whole lot to it. Um, uh, but all of the, all of them have names that way. And, uh, uh, you know, where it takes like kind of an adjective and then kind of uh, a noun and brings them together. And then is explaining it because one of the things in mazes that sets mazes uh, apart is that each character class is its own edge. So you might have an edge, which is kind of like a skill in another game, um, like deadly or fast or learned. And then you're using that to create opportunities um, to for advantage for your character. But you can also just use your character class name that way. So if I'm the savage barbarian and uh, I'm trying to hunt a deer, uh, even though I don't have any information that says, oh, you're a good hunter. It's like, well, I'm a savage barbarian. So obviously I had to have grown up hunting, uh, you know, local fauna. So I should be good at that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's one of those things that I love. And it's one of the reasons why it's very easy to make new character classes um, because you can make them very specific for your setting. So if I had a setting where... Uh, we're going to play in a port town uh, that has like a big navy piece. Like it would be very easy for me to be like, okay, well we're going to have the uh, we're going to have the deep elf. Uh, that's a, that's a character class we're going to want, and we're going to have the uh, uh, the cursed, uh, uh, you know, the 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 cursed mariner. Like you know, the guy that's got an albatross hung around his neck. Uh, so that's a character class that we would make, and. Um, you know, because it allows you to get to the tropes of what you're trying to do in your story and those specifics. Um, and since they're easy to make, you can specialty make them for campaigns. Um, it doesn't require all the work that uh, it, it does to create a character class for uh, a kind of an OSR game. Hmm. I see that there's a section about, about traps and um, and defining what they are uh, so is there is there like certain tools if someone wants to modify uh, a maze in some way they, they're able to do so uh, yeah no in fact I mean we, we we super encourage everything we every every so we look at traps as uh, just a different kind of hazard um, monsters are one kind of hazard traps are one kind of hazard the environment is one kind of hazard um, but they're all dealt with the same way and they're all powered by the same points um, and since the system is all 
um, narratively driven and powered on the part of the players. Uh, the GM never rolls dice. Um, it's very easy to uh, hack it up and change it and do those things. Um, in addition to what you see in the Mazes book itself, we also have a document uh, on our website, which is called um, uh, the, the Polymorph uh, Systems Worlds and Other Resource Document. Uh, and uh, that's basically for, it's more than just mazes. It's how to make games using the Polymorph system. Um, and that gives you all the tools for really getting under the, under the hood and making new things with the system. Um, oh, just, just to be clear, um, as, as, brief, as brief as you can, the Polymorph system, how, how you best describe that system? So the core of the system is this. Whenever you take an action, you are only ever going to roll your die. Each player is defined by a singular die. You're either the D4, the D6, the D8, or the D10. Um, uh, and that determines what you're going to do in the game. Um, in addition to that, your character may have edges, which are um, specific things around that character ability to do something that's going to give them an advantage when they roll the dice. Um, the game master or the MC, as we call it, um, the, the either the you know master of ceremonies or the maze controller, they have different names in different games. Um, the uh, uh, the MC doesn't roll dice. Um, they present a narrative situation. Uh, and the players react to it, and they roll dice. Um, and when you roll your dice, you are rolling against what we call the resolver. So there's a specific piece. In mazes, uh, we have... Uh, in mazes, the resolver looks like this. Um, and what it is is we books, boots, blades, or bones. And this is effectively using your mind, using your body... Uh, using violence or standing up against it. And you're trying to roll specific numbers. So books is two and three. So anytime I want to do something with perception, I want to roll a two or a three on my die. And it doesn't matter what game I'm playing. There might be different words. There might be different uh, norms. Um, it might not be called books, um, but it is two and three. And that's what's important. Rolling a two or a three is what's going to generate the result. Uh, that happens. Now, one of the cool things in the system is anytime I roll a one, we call that a key. If it's something my character could do, it just automatically works. Um, and then anytime I roll the top number on my die, uh, uh, so the four if I'm a D4, the 10 if I'm a D10, um, what I'm going to do is something special, and that's different based on the game. So in mazes, I get to succeed depending on what's going on with the darkness. In a game like Rebel Scum, that's more cinematic and uh, whenever I roll that, it always succeeds, um, uh, and, and it creates different opportunities. Um, and then different games have different sub-mechanics, so whether or not I have um, uh, resources that I spend to do cool stuff. So in mazes, we have stars, which allow us to do magical power, or hearts, which you know are our hit points. But in some of our other games, we don't have them. Um, but th they're all uh, effectively polymorph games. So, mm. And so um, all those games have a little piece that says right on it, uh, powered by polymorph, mm. uh, which looks like this. Oh, yes, like right. Like, yes. It's funny that you said excellent because this is the excellent. Oh. <laughs> the game about being excellent princesses, which is one of our... Uh, more family-friendly titles. So uh, I do want to say real fast to our viewers, and I'll put a link in our description um, in our for our video, but um, the quick start guide uh, that was available for Free RPG Day for Mazes. Oh, for Mazes. Yeah. Um, I think that's it's a fantastic. It's only like a, I believe like a 20-page booklet. Yeah. Um, but, but what I love about it is that it's, it's um, you can, Take it apart. It, every, everything has a use in a way. This book, usually books, quick start books, or a book for free RPG day. You know, usually have a, an adventure or it's a, a, a summary of the rules with with some nice art. But you can you can actually use uh, parts of the book for uh, for character sheets. You can actually use, use parts of the book to use clues for the, for the mazes. I thought I thought that was that was fantastic. We made this little flip book. The intention, um, our goal, like our idea was 
we love Free RPG Day. We're very involved in Free RPG Day. And we wanted to create a mazes book for Free RPG Day, but uh, we didn't just want it to be a, like a a tiny little thing. We, we, we wanted it to be something that you could use on the day of Free RPG Day. You could walk into a store. You could take it out of the box. You could literally sit down and play it. Um, uh, and that's what we came up with. And uh, hopefully we're going to do some more things like that. We're going to do, we're going to try to do one for Return to Dark Tower uh, in next year's box. So, Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, even though this book is, uh, you mentioned this already, but even though this is a standalone uh, book, you don't need anything else for it. Uh, you do have multiple mild, uh, ventures available on drive through RPG. Um, is there, would there be, uh, is there anything more coming down the pipeline for Mazes? Yeah, so um, so we just finished the first year of Mazes Monthly, so it's 12 modules. Um, we're going to do a new series of that, so 12 more modules. Um, our next game that comes out, Return to Dark Tower, which comes out in October, will be hitting store shelves, is 100% um, compatible. So everything that's in Return to Dark Tower can be used in Mazes. Um, and then our next big mazes thing will be next year. It's called City of Skull, uh, and it's going to be a campaign world uh, with a bunch of adventures and its own set of modules and, 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 and everything. And we're really excited for, for City of Skull. So. Mm. Well, excellent. What, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about uh, this, this fantastic book. Uh, is there any um, last words, anything you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, if anyone is was interested with us talking about the Mazes Free RPG Day thing, that is now available uh, digitally on Drive Through. It's available on Itch. It's available on our website, uh, and you can get it. And you can just print it out, and you can uh, play a game of Mazes at home without needing the book. You can just go and just flip through the pages and just do what it says. And it's got character sheets that are ready to go. And all you need is uh, some D4s, some D6s, some D8s, and some D10s. And uh, have a good time, and then uh, come to our website, and uh, and and uh, or go to your friendly local game store and get a copy of Mazes for yourself. Mm. Uh, again, thank you, Chris, for taking the time to talk to us about Mazes. Um, and uh, to our viewers, again, all that information will be in the description below. Thank you for watching. Be safe out there. We'll see you next time.